friend of mine, Peter Egan, wrote, once wrote a great story in Road and Track magazine that if you want to look for old cars, go to a, a small airport because the wings of an airplane have lot, leave lots of room to put cars underneath them. And so we're at a small airport today. I happened to meet this great guy a, cu a couple of weeks ago, Willie Vinton. And Willie is the, uh, the curator and the manager of the Fountainhead Auto Museum in Fairbanks, Alaska. He has assembled what I think is one of the finest museums in the United States. I just went there a couple weeks ago. I said, Willie, you know anybody with old cars? We're going to be shooting an episode of Barn Find Hunter. And he says, well, I've got a couple of old cars. And he happens to own a couple of airplane hangars. So uh, Peter Egan's story uh, is coming true in Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, Willie's going to open up his hangar and show us what he's got inside there. Are they, are they underneath wings, by the way? No, no, I don't have any airplanes in okay. here. Okay. I don't have room for airplane in that hangar. <laughs> too, too many cars? <laughs> too many cars. OK, cool. Yeah. Well, let's see what you have. Kind of a mess in there, but I like this kind of mess. Well, th this is one of the most e eclectic little grouping of cars I've seen in a while. <laughs> this obviously is uh, has my attention. 1947 Mercury one-ton pickup. I don't think I've ever seen one in my life. So, yeah. okay, Mercury. Tell tell us about that. Well, it's a Canadian-built Ford pickups. They started building them in 1946. And so this is the second year for him. Very few of the early ones left. And I chased this one for almost 25 years before I got it. And the Mercury pickups were a little bit fancier in some of the trim stuff than uh, the Fords were. Uh -huh. But just a great old pickup. It's had an awful rough life. Where did you find it? Uh, here in Fairbanks. In Fairbanks, okay. And the sad part is I don't have much history on it, but I've went through the running gear and it, and it runs. So it's got a standard flathead V8? Yeah, it's all original. Can we open the hood? Yeah. The only thing I did is I put aluminum heads on it because the heads were cracked on it. Oh, yeah, okay. So is it Edelbrock or something? These are original old Offenhauser uh -huh. heads. You got an alternator on there. Yep. Yeah, six volt alternator. So do you drive this around? I. Not much, but I just, just finished the taillights on it here a while back. Okay, okay. So I got lights all working on so it. So this was that standard Ford Green that you see yeah. on so many 50s trucks. Yeah, it's, uh, we haven't, I haven't even waxed it yet. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Can you start it? Sure. I think it's got a starting problem. It starts too quickly. Yeah. Man, is that sweet. Did you rebuild the motor? Yeah. Is that a uh, 100 horsepower? This is 85. 85. Yeah. Okay. Isn't that sweet? So one ton. Amazing. We can run this outside if you want. Oh, yeah. Could we? Yeah. Okay. Let's yeah. do that. Okay. So we're going to pull this out. so fast now. <laughs> Now I have to get back in that old clumper. So 
tell me about this tailgate. But you see what they did is they stamped this out, the stamped the Ford out. And if you measure a Ford tailgate, it's exactly the yeah. Ford script is exactly that size. Wow. So then they made these and just put them in and spot welded them. But you can see where somebody was hooking up to a trailer and the hitch was a little high or something. And, and if you look at the sides, the sad part about this thing on that side over there, somebody, and I've never seen it before, but it had two foot square, one or two inch particle board. So the bed's got to come off of it this winter and because the woods, everything underneath it's a wood structure. So you're going to rebuild the bed, really? Just the bottom. Not the metal? No. Okay, well now we have room to go look at this Model A you've got yeah. too. This Model A, tell me, you said it has an unusual history? Well, yeah, this was bought new in Dawson City to Which is deliver Alaska? Mail. No, it's in Canada, Canada just across okay. the border. Now, one thing you can tell about the ARs, as you can tell this is a, a restoration waiting to happen, is that the emergency brake is on the left. Like a Model T. Yes, that was the very first Model A's were built that way. They called them the ARs. And this one was built in December of 1927. 1927, so it was still being built during the last year of the Model T. Right, yeah. They, they closed production. So this yep. is, do you it's, know the serial number? Is this one of the first ones? I don't know, because I got to pull the body off to get the correct serial number off of it, because it's got a different engine in it. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. what color will this be, do you think? What color can you identify? Well, I got to go back and do some research, but it looks like it was a dark blue. I see. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I love it when they haven't been molested. Yep. So two unique vehicles. So now we are on your third one here. Well, which... the third one over there, is a 1975 AMC Gremlin. So what's the story with this car? Well, that was the last car my dad bought. Oh, wow, he bought it new? No, he bought it used, and it's uh, never been messed with. It's got 62,000 miles on it. Original paint? Yeah. So did your dad live in Alaska? No, he was in Montana. Montana, okay. Mm -hmm. Have you driven this car? Yeah, <clears throat> I drove it about, no, oh, I brought it up here about 20 years ago, I guess. So it's an automatic, keys are in the ignition, yep. a bench seat. Huh. Yep. Oh. Well, thank you, sir. You betcha. This, this has been a great way to start the morning. Well, good. It didn't get much better than this, you know. So we're going over to see a guy named Peter Lundquist right now. I met him last week when I was here, driving around the state, but I asked him, you know, you know any cars in the area? He said, I got some at my house. And so, I mean, I have my hangar, so here we are at the hangar. Peter! Thanks for meeting me. Yeah, you're welcome. I met Peter a week and a half ago. We're driving around uh, Fairbanks on a, a kind of a pleasure drive. And actually, Peter is a good friend of my friend David, who loaned us this Mustang. He said, you got to meet Peter. He's got a cool car in his hangar where he keeps his own collector cars. And there's one back there that just, bam, that's the car. So follow me. All right, so I don't want to put the words in your mouth. Tell me about this car. Totally original other than the wheels, but my, my brother bought it in 1975 when he was going to law school in Puget Sound. He bought it in Tacoma, and then he drove it to law school every day. And uh, in the summers, he would, uh, drive it up to Alaska, work up here, drive it back in the fall and go back to law school. And then uh, shortly after he uh, graduated, passed the bar, then he got killed by a drunk driver. Ah. Um, pretty unfortunate, but um, you know, I ended up with a car. I haven't done much with it. I, it'll start right up and drive. It's very solid. How long has it been sitting here? It's been sitting here for 12 years. You remember what he paid for it? $500. I have the canceled check at home. Do you really? Yeah. Now this car has some unique features. It may look like a, 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 an average 57 Chevy wagon, but if you notice, the first thing you notice, it's a two-door. Okay, so it's a two-door wagon, so it's not a Nomad. If I were to tell you it's not even a wagon, you'd probably scratch your head and what's, what's going on here? So tell us why, why this car is unique, Peter. It's unique because it's a rare um, sedan delivery, is what it is, and uh, they, the, GM called a window delivery, but they built 
a very limited production of uh, sedan deliveries with glass in the back. So it looks like a station wagon, but sedan delivery trim, sedan, sedan delivery back, there's no back seat, sedan delivery back door, and the VIN number has SD for sedan delivery. So sedan deliveries, if you think about it, was a panel, kind of a panel van, and, yeah. and it was just metal around here, and a lot of times florists would put their name of their business or a plumbing business, but the, the, you know, the telltale mark for a sedan delivery is a one-piece tailgate. Station wagon had the window went up, the tailgate went down. But this is a one piece. Can I open this? Sure. Yep. All right. So it's a one piece tailgate. That was a sedan delivery exclusive. Also, as Peter said, there's no back seat. You can see back here is just a compartment for uh, storing things. So who ordered this car and why? Um, they made them specifically for the government. So d I think they were all Department of Agriculture or uh, Forestry is what I understand. I've never seen, I've seen other pictures of one and they were all bare bones. So they were straight six, no, no real options, plain Jane work vehicle. So this is a 150. Uh, most base model 55, 56, 57 Chevys are two tens. You could tell a 150. Now look, if I make a mistake, don't criticize me, because I don't know everything about 57 Chevys. But a 150 had no door handles, you know, door, no armrests on here. No armrests. So you had to close it with a door handle. That's probably why a lot of them are broken. This was a, a 210 option. I believe they only had one sun visor, but this one has two, so I may, may, may be mistaken in that area. Uh, it's got a radio delete, clock delete. And let's, I'm gonna see how many miles are on this thing. 99,636 miles. It's got a three on the tree. If you look at this, there's nothing on this dashboard. There's no, you know, brass trim, gold trim or anything like that. It's a basic, basic car. The 150s also had the most basic steering wheel. Just one small horn button in the center. No deluxe horn ring around there. And, that, and that's it. It, it. It's a basic, basic delivery vehicle or work vehicle, and as Peter said, this was ordered by the government for forestry work. And I, I really wonder how your brother found it. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. You know, he, he must have uh, just, uh, he, brought it, he bought it off a private party. Okay, so he didn't so buy it from the government. Got it. There's a sticker on the dashboard somewhere near the steering wheel that has the unit number for, I think it's Department of Agriculture really? or such, it's somewhere near oh. the steering wheel there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. And uh, the log books are still in the glove box from oil changes and stuff that the government did. No you know, kidding. The, yeah, there's log book in there for... Oh, look at this. This is unbelievable. United States Department of Agriculture, Chevrolet 57, fiscal year ending Jul June 30th, 1975. So this was in use for a long time. So he must have bought it right after they decommissioned it. Right. Yeah. So this must be like receipts, yeah, for oil changes, vehicle inspection. Um, there's the, the tag number, the VIN number. This is intriguing. And uh, so here's a government vehicle operators, your guide to service stations for gasoline, oil, and lube. Jeez, this is amazing stuff. So I guess this was a, a required piece of documentation for people that drove government vehicles. Wow, pretty cool stuff. Well, that's pretty amazing. The 150s were the stripped down versions of uh, Chevrolet sedans. I, I think they all had posts, whether it was in a sedan version. Um, and I believe that's what they used for the Black Widow, which was a 283 engine, fuel-injected version, which was the most high-performance version. Uh, it was built to be a race car, a NASCAR race car, or a drag race car. But this one is a, on the other end of the scale. Basic, basic, three-speed on the tree, and a six-cylinder on the motor. Let's flip that hood open there and take a look at that. And I'm not sure what the cubic inches are, probably something like 215 or something like that.
So there it is. Um, 99,000 miles. It probably still runs like a clock. Did it run pretty it, well? It'll fire right up. <laughs> it, it'll drive real nice. Jeez. And, and, yep, but. So what's your intention for this car? I'm going to build it stock, just like it is, but get the real wheels and right. uh, poverty hubcaps. Those and, little uh, pipe, little little tiny dog-ish yep, things? Yep, small little, uh, the small yeah. hubcaps and uh, keep it just stock. I have every piece, every part, so Man. do it as stock as I can. Is the body pretty solid? Pretty solid. It's going to need some some work, uh -huh. you know, but uh, in the 70s, driving back and forth to Washington, there's half that road was uh, dirt oh so yeah. he, so uh, silty dirt you know builds up so it's going to need some work but for the most part really solid you know another thing i'm just noticing is that 57 chevys i believe that were made in california had a one-piece front bumper and and 57 chevys made in, in detroit had a seam here and a seam here correct so yeah. that's a so this is probably a california car i think so yeah, yeah. it's definitely a one-piece bumper yep and that's the original bumper, so. Mm -hmm. Researching this car, there's no value for this car that we can find because it's, it's too rare. It's, there's ne probably never been one brought to an auction. This, this might be the only one left in the world. And it is a 235 cubic inch, six cylinder, 140 horsepower, and it served this purpose. I mean, that's all it needed to have. So, nice car. So we walk over here. Peter, tell me about this car. Right here? It's, it's a 1914 uh, Model T town car. And uh, town car was the most expensive Model T built at the time. And they did, so they didn't sell very many of them. Uh, it was coach built by a company outside of Ford for bu building the actual body. Mm -hmm. But it was meant for taxi cabs or chauffeuring. So the people sat in the back with glass partitions and the driver sat up front. But very rare. Town car club says there's two left in existence. This is number three. So there's three left in existence of this model. No kidding. What's your intention for this? Build it back to stock. Build um, it back I'm to stock. working that way. I've got the mechanical parts. I've got everything I need. It's just uh, a matter of getting to it and the money to pay someone to restore it. Sure. So. Yeah. Wow. It would look like that promotional picture that's on the wall. That's oh, a Ford, that. Ford promotional picture from 1914. So that's the exact model. And how did you come to acquire this? My dad bought it in 1954. And wow. so it's always been a Fairbanks car. The original owner bought it brand new, barged it up to Fairbanks, opened a taxi cab company. Supposedly did it for a year and a half, two years, wrecked it, damaged the front end and, and sold it for scrap. So that it's been in Fairbanks its whole life. Okay, well now we're gonna look at another Ford of a slightly newer vintage. As we walk by Peter's other cool cars. Um, so a friend of mine, David Carpick, has loaned me his GT350 to use for our trip here in Fairbanks as our, our vehicle, as, as a substitute for the, the Woody. Uh, this is an, another one of his cars. He and his wife Katie have a, a great little collection of Fords. And uh, this is a Boss 302 that he owns that uh, he found and told me a little bit about it. That's original paint on there. So it's a Boss 302 1970 original paint car. It's got, it looks like it's got an 8-track tape deck. So this was a model, the Boss 302, was built around the time uh, that the Z28 Camaro was being built. Uh, and, and it was it was in response to the Trans Am series. The car companies had to homologate their race cars by building a certain number of street versions of it. And the, the cubic inch uh, limit on the Trans Am series was five liters. So they had to build these cars for the street so they could race them. Guys like Bud Moore would build cars for Parnelli Jones and Dan Gurney, uh, people like that. Swede Savage, Sam Posey, all drove cars like this in the Trans Am series. So this is one of those cars. It's a 70, and this could be for sale. I mean, David told me, yeah, I, I think I would consider selling that. So uh, this will make somebody a happy owner one day, potentially. A rare car, a desirable car, a high-performance car, a fun car to own. So if this car were uh, in fair condition, number four condition, 
it would be a $44,700 car. In good condition, $68,200. In excellent condition, $97,900. And if it were Concours, $128,000. So, you know, what's this one? Uh, original paint, it, it's probably a good condition car, so somewhere in the 60s, I suppose. I think this uh, trip to Fairbanks has been particularly fruitful in that uh, we haven't found a lot of cars ourselves, but because we went to a, uh, a car, an antique car event a week and a half ago and made all sorts of leads, we were able to uh, meet people who knew about cars or had cars themselves. So we've just come back here this week and call that number and call that number, like taking orders. So this, this has been a great time in Fairbanks. We're not done yet. Uh, we're gonna keep driving around looking for cars, but uh, if you have a chance to come to Fairbanks, check out the, the Auto Museum, Fountainhead Auto Museum, and scoot around some of the back roads and maybe find some cars like this. Happy hunting. This is the last known midget race car that ran in, in Alaska. And they used to have a racetrack over where Seekins Ford is now called the Rendezvous Racetrack. A gentleman named John Goss that brought nine midget race cars from Seattle area to Alaska to race. He was flagging a motorcycle race over here and he flagged the winner and the second bike hit him and killed him. And so that was actually the demise of the midget race cars.